Will you bow your heads with me? Let's pray over the preaching of the word this morning. Father, we have come to the time in the service when we are very deliberately opening your word. Father, I pray that nothing that happens here would be of our own accord. Everything that takes place from this pulpit this morning would be of you. That it would be your words, God. Pray that we would each have open hearts, open minds to anything that you may wish to share with us, God. Even as I deliver some of these words, God, I pray that you would convict me, that you would change me. And likewise, Lord, that you would change each of us in this room for your glory and for your good, God. Pray that you would speak and you would move in this place this morning. Thank you and praise you. Amen. 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 Throughout the Old Testament, which is the first portion of your Bible, contains much of the early world and biblical history, we have many examples and instances of what we call sacrifices being offered. Those are offered up to God, traditionally. In some cases, offered to idols. And as you probably know, this was done before Jesus died on the cross and before we were able to each approach God as individuals. According to the Old Testament laws, which we'll get into a little bit later, the very acts of repentance and worship, and even committing to a vow that was taken involved the symbolic sacrifice or the symb- excuse me, the very acts of repentance and worship were performed symbolically through the offering of a sacrifice. And the first example we see of this kind of thing is from almost the very beginning. Genesis chapter 4 is the very first book of your Bible, the fourth chapter. And that involves two of Adam and Eve's sons, Cain and Abel. Cain farmed the soil, had crops, don't know exactly what kind. Abel farmed animals. And there came a time in which the Scripture says they each brought an offering to the Lord. Cain brought some fruits, and Abel brought fat portions from the firstborn of his flocks, so the Scripture tells us. Now, the Lord looked very favorably on Abel's offering, because Abel's offering was, what I would say, the best of the first. But Cain's offering, the Bible tells us God did not look favorably on it. Because it was not the best, it was not the first, it was just something. And from the very earliest pages of human history, we see this concept over and over again of presenting something to God, but not just something, giving Him the best of the first. Now, when we use terms like sacrifice, what I will be referring to today in this morning's message is the ritualistic method by which the best animal in the flock or the best of the fruits of the soil, be it a grain or maybe a fruit or a vegetable, are left on an altar or burned sacrificially as a way of doing a couple things. Seeking God's forgiveness for sin, signifying the taking of a vow or the completing, having fulfilled the commitments of a vow that you took, or simply as an act of worship. And we see this over and over again, people offering something to God or sacrificing an animal or crops. But in each case, the same bottom line message is there. God wants our best. He doesn't want what's left. He doesn't want something that we still have after we've taken care of all of our other needs and wants. He wants our best. And we're not just talking about the fruits of our labor. This plays into other areas of our life, too. And that's exactly what we're going to get into today. At the end of the book of Exodus, we come to the Ten Commandments, the first set of 
true laws that we see in the Bible. And those laws govern people for some time. We see the building of the tabernacle. And then we get to the book of Leviticus. It's not a very fun book. Leviticus outlines all of the laws and procedures that God gave to mankind and to the Israelites. All of those things that were to govern everyday life. And it's, it's interesting. Just flip through it sometime. Browse it a little bit. You'll see God covered everything. <laughs> Much more expansive than the Ten Commandments. But it's interesting how much detail is actually in there. The specific situations that God points out and uses people to point out and says, if this happens, this is how you treat it. But if this happens and then that happens, do it like this instead. It's interesting the completeness of the scriptures that we see. And there are also very clear guidelines in Leviticus for the giving of sacrifices and offerings. There's numerous chapters and references on how to give it, what it should look like, who should be involved, what kind of animal, what to do with the skin, how long it should burn. It's fascinating. And oftentimes we see examples of people like maybe a Moses or an Abraham, a nation, national leader, presenting an offering or a sacrifice. We don't often see individuals doing it. We see some. The rest of the time, it involves a priest or a leader in the temple structure. And that's interesting because just because of the fact that a priest or a pastor was involved in this ritualistic ceremony, there are cases in Scripture in which they really screwed it up. Sometimes we deceive ourselves and think because a leader is involved, because a religious leader is involved, Everything is okay. That's not the case at all, is it? Pastors, priests, they're not immune to the temptations and the effects of sin. Just because you go and you know, pursue years of religious institutional teaching, you're still a person, aren't you? You're still born with a sinful nature. Now, our text for the day comes from the book of Malachi, and it's specifically addressing exactly that, in which priests were giving and offering sacrifices, but it wasn't done the way God wanted it. And I'm not purely talking about, you know, the methods and the processes in which they submitted these sacrifices, but really the heart behind it and the motives behind it. And that's where we're going to pick up. If you will turn with me to Malachi chapter 1, we'll begin in verse 6. The priests polluted offerings. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to you. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts, but you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted, and its fruit, that is, its food may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is, and you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence, or is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering. 
Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. You know, we don't have time this morning to go through all of what we call Levitical law and discuss all the guidelines and processes for sacrifices. But even from that short passage, you see the message was very clear. The sacrifices God expected had to be perfect. The offerings were not, you know, the lame sheep in the flock. They were not the spotted calf or the blind bull. They were truly the best that you had to offer. And I just want to put that out there because we'll come back to some of these verses later on. I want you to keep that in mind, that what God's looking for is the very best. And that also means, that doesn't mean we're going to do it perfectly. That doesn't mean that what we have to offer is what somebody else would say is the best. But it's offering our best and serving with our best and giving our talents in the best way we can. That may not be as good as somebody else's talent, but we're giving what God has given us, using that talent for His purposes and our best. Is that, I hope that makes sense the way I'm explaining that. When Jesus died and the great curtain in the temple ripped in two, it signified that people could then approach Him directly. What used to separate the temple from the part of the temple that had what we call the Holy of Holies, which is where God's presence dwelled, Prior to him dying on the cross, only the highest priests could enter that area and more or less have conversations with God. And if the priests didn't follow the, the laws and the guidelines God set apart for that, they were struck down and died. But when that curtain ripped in two, when Jesus took our sins and died on the cross, all of that went away overnight, if you will immediately. And now in 2023, we can come directly to God. We no longer have to place a sacrifice, bring an offering. We bring ourselves. We are the offering, exactly. In the passages we just read, Malachi is calling out priests who were not following the process prior to Jesus dying on the cross. And in his words, offering polluted food. You see, they were fulfilling the basic requirements of a sacrifice, very basic, but not to the fullest extent, and nor were their hearts in what they were doing. Maybe they felt as long as they were putting something on the altar, it's all okay. <laughs> but like we said before, God doesn't want something. He wants the best, Amen. not because he's selfish and jealous of what we have to offer. He doesn't need it, but he wants our hearts. And when we hold back our hearts, he can't, he can't work, he won't work with that. <laughs> Amen? Yeah, I'm not a priest, and I'm not a licensed minister or pastor, but when I read that, that section out of Malachi, I saw parallels to my life. I started thinking of ways in which I've offered polluted offerings to God. And what I want to do today is mention some of those to you. Maybe some of you here can relate with some of that as well, get something out of that word. Another thing that I think is worthwhile pointing out here is that what we're doing in this passage this morning proves the Bible is for everyone. Yes, this book of Malachi is for the, was written for the Israelites. Yes, that passage was written for the priests. But I'll tell you what, this week, God used that passage to change my heart. And I've never been to divinity school. No, nowhere in Scripture do we get the idea that part of it applies to some people. Or that it's only applicable sometimes. No, 2 Timothy says all Scripture 
is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I think it's amazing that, you know, thousands of years ago, when these words were written, at that time, it was written and given to the priests. But now, seeing the entire Scripture together, we can be impacted by every word of it, regardless of our status in society or our career path. And the way God put everything together that is in perfect harmony with everything else that's in this book, again, only God, only our God can do that. One thing that makes Him the one and only true God, the only way by which man can be saved. <laughs> We're getting off topic here, sorry. In the Old Testament, there were a number of different kinds of these sacrifices, these offerings, numerous instances of it, and they all fulfilled various purposes, but overarching, they broadly all fell into three main categories. There were burnt offerings, grain offerings, and peace offerings. What I'm going to do this morning is look through each of those three types, present them to you. And talk about what they might look for us look like look like for us today, and extrapolate on the subtle or maybe not so subtle areas in which we might be defiling those sacrifices in our lives and polluting them as we present them to God in 2023. Are you ready? Yeah. Starting with the first one, the burnt offering. This is also called a sin offering, and as its name suggests was required to atone for sin. That could be the sin of an individual, a family. There are a few instances in which an offering or sacrifice was placed on behalf of an entire people or nation. The last week, Pastor George brought us a message talking about the power of habit. And when I began looking at this section of Malachi and thinking about these burnt offerings, that message came back to my mind. This one of the key points of that message was the effects that habits have on our lives, whether good or bad. Can I ask you this morning, how many times have you gotten on your knees or maybe, you know, driving down the highway, you've said a prayer asking God to forgive you for something. And then later that day, that week, you go right back to it. That bad Sinful, habitual habit. Proverbs 26 says, Like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. Sometimes when I'm <laughs> confessing something to God, and he drops that scripture in my mind. I never like it when he does. <laughs> it's a horrible image. And what do dogs do? They vomit, and sometimes later on they go back and eat the vomit. That's what we're doing when we run back to our sin. We know it's wrong. When we're honest with ourselves, we know exactly what we're doing is out of place. And looking at it in light of Malachi, verse 8 says, When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? When you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor? And now entreat the favor of God that he might be gracious to you. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts. Is there a habit, a sinful habit that you're still clinging to? I won't ask for a show of hands or <laughs> testimonies. Furthermore, would you agree with me that Seeking God's forgiveness for something without also offering a change in lifestyle or something taking place is kind of like what Malachi is talking about. It's like offering a blind or a sick animal and putting it on the altar and thinking that's enough. When we don't change something to address those habitual types of sins, how meaningful do you really think those confessions are when God hears them? Not that there's anything we can do to earn the forgiveness. I'm not talking about works-based salvation. That's 
not scriptural. And I'm certainly not talking about making penance or reciting the right words in a prayer a certain number of times. It's not what the Bible teaches. What kind of message are we giving to God when we briefly ask Him to help us or quickly say, oh, Lord, I did it again. Please forgive me. And then we go on about our business not changing anything. It's like empty words. Is your offering polluted? Is your sin offering, your burnt sacrifice polluted? Something to think about. The rest of verse 8 goes on to say, present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor? I about laughed out loud when I read that verse. A really powerful, really powerful setup. And then the Lord said, you know, present that to your boss. What's he going to think? Let's talk about it. If you really mess something up at work, what kind of response does your boss want? Do they just want to, hey, sorry, next time, and no change in behavior? Of course not. They want to see that you're going to do something different to hopefully prevent that error, or that mistake, from ever happening again, if at all possible. And actually what your employer really wants is both. They want to see you taking responsibility maybe actually giving some kind of apology, of course, depending on the circumstances, and then doing something different. And God wants the same thing from each of us. When we don't offer God the best, I'm not sure we can experience the freedom of breaking those habits because we're only giving it a half-hearted effort and we're asking God to give the other. like giving 1% and asking God to give 99. He wants 100% of our effort and our heart, and then he will give another 100 back by way of forgiving our sin and helping us move on from some of those things, especially a habitual sin. There is freedom in the power of Christ. Let's talk about the good habits, good sacrifices, the other side of that burnt offering. Let's say you want to take the advice of Pastor George last week and really set that habit in motion of reading your Bible every day. You're going to have to do a little bit more than setting a goal and getting the Bible ready. For me, for my family schedule at home, what works best for me is having my prayer time, my Bible time first thing in the morning. And I have a Bible on my nightstand. I see it every night before I turn the light off. It's a visual reminder to me to read my Bible the next morning. I have a goal in my head that tomorrow morning I'm going to spend time with God before anything else. But having that goal in my head, having a Bible on my nightstand, doesn't do anything. You know what does something? Setting my alarm 30 minutes earlier sacrificing the time I'd rather be in bed. That's the only way that habit is formed for me. And I won't pretend that it is a good habit for me, but I'm just being honest with you. You have to do more than just setting a goal or having an idea. You have to change something, do something. And then once that alarm goes off, <laughs> we all know how that works. <laughs> kind of wish there wasn't a snooze button, don't you? Let's talk about the grain offering, number two. The grain offering was submitted for Thanksgiving or out of an act of worship. And those offerings, as the name suggests, revolved around crops, fruits, vegetables, the like. And when a grain offering was submitted, it often involved the baking of some kind of loaf or bread. And Scripture was very clear. There could be no yeast in the bread, there could be no honey, no sweetener. It was to be pure. One of the first things that came to my mind when I thought of what a modern-day version is of a, a Thanksgiving offering 
is asking myself if I'm sharing in the abundance that I have with others who don't. We no longer have to bring a loaf. We don't have to bring a loaf to church and put on the altar at 10 o'clock. But is there something that God wants me to be sharing out of the abundance he's given me that I'm not? Maybe it's the tithe. The scripture is very clear about that. He asks for a tithe from our financial earnings. And I'll tell you right now, the tithe is not God's fundraising plan for the church. God didn't write that passage or inspire the passage. I don't have the reference either. Because the church needed money. You know what the tithe really is? It's telling God, okay, I trust you with this. You can trust him with everything else in your life, but what about your wallet? The wallet is usually the last thing people give to God. And I'm not here appealing for an offering. We're not going to pass the plate around again, anything like that. But I want you to think about that concept. Maybe go home and research what a tithe is. What does the Bible say about a tithe? Is it something you're doing, not doing? And I can tell you from my own experience, God blesses you when you give him that tithe portion. And when I say blessed, don't get confused. God blesses the things we do. God may bless your health. He may bless your car and keep it running. He may bless the water heater in your house to last 30 years when it's only rated for five. He may bless where your children grow up and end up doing. He may bless your house from getting broken into next week. When you give God the best, he will take care of the rest. And that includes our money. Amen? Amen. Malachi 1.13 says, You bring what has been taken by violence, or is lame, or sick, and this you bring as your offering. Let me ask you another question. Have you ever thanked God for something that he didn't really directly give you? Maybe you're sitting here quietly listening, but your heart is wishing you had taken that Sunday morning shift you were offered. Make a little extra money. Maybe this is the first time you've heard a Sunday morning message in a while because of all those extra shifts you've been taking. Maybe the only time you say, thank you, God, is when you cash those big paychecks. Did God really give you that extra money? Something to think about. Maybe you don't have the option to take Sundays off. I know a few people here with difficult jobs that don't have that option. Let me ask you this. What, what are you doing about it? Have you ever prayed about it? Have you ever asked God to help make a way where you don't see a way? Have you ever turned down an optional Sunday morning shift so you could fellowship here in person? See, back to what we talked about earlier. Are you giving God the best the first? or just giving him something. When we just give him something, it's like bringing a sick animal and sacrificing that on the altar. The other side of the grain offering is not just thanksgiving, but worship. Is your worship sick and lame, or is it also the best of the first? When Karen gets up here and leads worship and says, everybody, let's lift your hands together, and you do that, are you doing it because of the worship in your heart or because you want to look like what everybody else is doing and maybe fool everybody into thinking everything's okay in your life and you're a worshiper just like the rest? If I ask for a show of hands this morning of, who is thankful for what God has done in your life or what he's blessed you with? I bet every, every hand would go up. But being thankful is only part of it. 
yes, we ought to be grateful. And a grateful attitude, a grateful heart will change a lot of things in our life, but that's only part of it. The challenge and the, if I can use that word again for the umpteenth time, sacrifice in each of our lives is how are we using those things God has given us? Do your God-given talents glorify God? Does God get the best of your talent, a part of it, or none at all? For those of you who are involved here and, you know, come before 10 o'clock Sunday mornings because of some purpose you fulfill, are you here on time? If you teach Sunday school, do you wait until 9 o'clock Saturday night to pull out your lesson and make sure you have something prepared? Worship team, did you practice the songs? When was the last time you prayed over the ministry you're involved in? For that matter, let's just talk about showing up on Sunday morning. Do you only come to church when you went to bed on time? Do you ever look for an excuse not to be here? Or when for some reason you aren't here, do you make it a point to tune into the live stream that we're fortunate to have so you can get something? Or do you just say, ah, wait, maybe next week I'll, I'll go to church? Hebrews 10 says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. See, when I read that, I see a very good reason to get up early Sunday morning and come to church. I hope you do as well. But I'll, you know what? I'll give you another very practical reason to be plugged into a local church. This body of people here that you see as you look around the room is a network. I'm not talking about LinkedIn and business personal networking. This is a network of people that you can reach out to when you're in a bind, when you don't know what to do. Maybe you don't know where to start. You're in a room full of people who are more than happy to help. Do you need accountability, breaking a bad habit like Pastor George was talking about last week? Look around the room. You're in a room full of sinners who were saved by grace, who have or maybe still are dealing with the same struggles, the same temptations, the same thoughts and feelings that you are right now. Maybe you just have questions about the Bible. Maybe this is all new to you and you just don't know where to start or what to think or what's right, what's wrong, why this church or another church and I'll give you a great opportunity. 8.45 every Sunday morning, we have an adult Sunday school class downstairs that is a very open format. I'm not often able to attend it. I wish I could more. But when I do, that's what I love about it the most. You know, the, one of the running jokes in the class is how long it takes to get through some of the books of the Bible. Because not only will there be much discussion on a single verse or passage, but oftentimes something else comes up in the discussion or somebody has a question or something is brought up unrelated to last week and next week and that becomes the focus of the, of the class. Let's talk about it. Have a question about the Bible? 845. <laughs> it's a perfect setting to bring something up and just get wisdom from another mature believer. Need some encouragement? I can think of more than a few people in this room who have gone through great, great challenges and who would truly and genuinely love to sit down with you and help you work through yours. How about that leak in sink? <laughs> or that funny noise in your car every time you make a right-hand turn? It would be foolish to think that nobody in this room here has any idea or anybody they can recommend to help you take care of something at the house or something in the car. You are surrounded by people who want to help you. If you're not already plugged into a local church, I implore you, find a church that believes the Bible, first of all, and preaches this from the pulpit. Get yourself plugged in. This is not about a denomination. This is not about Family Life Church in Waukegan. This is about the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
and the very practical aspects of being involved in a church. Amen? Amen. Now, I don't say this to condemn you. I don't want anybody to feel condemned over anything that we're talking about this morning. I just want you to look in the mirror. Have an honest conversation with yourself. Maybe with your spouse or family, something involves them. If we can get to that place where we can have those kinds of conversations, it's funny how then we start to see God's hand. We start to see what he's doing, what he's not doing. We start to recognize areas where he has done something. But until we get to that point, it's, sometimes it's like we have blinders on. We're just, just going about our business, not even really aware of God's work. Lastly is the peace offering. We talked about the burnt offering, talked about the grain offering. Now we've come to the peace offering. This offering was typically submitted as part of a worship ceremony or as part of a vow. One example from Scripture is from 1 Samuel, where we meet Hannah. The Bible tells us Hannah was barren. She was unable to bear children, and this greatly distressed her for a long time. One day she was crying out to God and more or less, he's summarizing here, she more or less cried out to God and said, if you give me a son, God, I will give him back to you and devote him to priesthood and give him to the church and they can raise him and he can become a priest. God chose to answer that prayer. And the best part is not that, but that when God answered that prayer, Hannah followed through on that vow. First Samuel tells us that after her son named Samuel was weaned from breast milk, she took him to the temple, gave a peace offering. That was her sign as having fulfilled that vow. And then she basically handed her son to the priests to raise him into that life, just as she had promised the Lord. Many of you have stood before this altar, this church right here, and dedicated your children to the Lord. We have those services a couple times a year. Somebody has a baby, they choose to publicly dedicate them to the Lord. When was the last time you thought about that, that dedication service? <laughs> Mike's thinking. <laughs> And when we do those services, you're not making a declaration that your child will work in ministry someday. But what you're doing is symbolically and publicly devoting them to God's kingdom. And both the, the family, the parents up here, and the congregation take a vow in fulfilling their respective parts in that. Whatever that is, whether it's actually raising the child as the parent or being involved in ministries. Maybe you're the world's best youth director. Fulfill that vow on behalf of the kids that are being dedicated. That's all part of the process, right? Think about where your children are today. Did you either fulfilling that vow or defiling it, has that affected where they are today, who they've become. I'll give you another vow. This is another not-so-fun one. Let's talk about marriage. In my mind, the peace offering of marriage is holding tight to that vow, part of which says, till death do us part. Now, let me preface this by saying we will briefly talk about marriage. This is by no means exhaustive. Um, today, we're not going to get into the aspects of separation and divorce and that discussion. What I want to do is briefly focus on those who are married, and I want to get each of you in this room just to ask some honest questions to yourself, not your spouse, to yourself to question whether you've been personally faithful in fulfilling your marital vows. Have you polluted the marriage vow? 
Again, not your spouse. Let's talk about you for a second. Let's talk about finances. Do you make large purchases without your spouse knowing? Do you make improper purchases without your spouse knowing? Do you even share your finances? It's a whole other topic of discussion. You know, there was a time when gambling happened really only at casinos. Pornography really only happened at adult bookstores and maybe the back of a gas station. Now, don't even have to get out of bed. All of that and more. If you're married and you're in bed together, can I say you should also be in each other's phones? I firmly believe your spouse should have 100% access to your electronic devices. I don't mean, it's Saturday morning, honey, give me your phone. I mean, we don't hide anything. You agreed to be with a partner for life. And when you hide something, you're not enabling that partnership. It's not a partnership anymore. It's a roommate. Speaking of phones and computers and electronics, do you have any kind of filter on your internet? Yes, your kids need it too. We already talked about fulfilling your vow in having dedicated them to God, but I'm talking about you, the adults. What's preventing you from browsing the internet when you get those temptations, those urges? What stops you, the adult? who's supposed to be mature and supposed to not do those things and be the example for your children. How about that attractive guy you see every morning when you get your coffee? Do you find yourself hoping he's there tomorrow too? <laughs> How about that, uh, does your wife know about that coworker that's really easy to talk to and is such a good listener? Now, if I can be honest with you for a second, for one, those things happen, don't they? Just because you get married, especially to those who are unmarried sitting here today, just because you get married does not mean you stop being a human. And it doesn't mean the feelings go away or that you will never develop feelings for other people. So don't pretend that it will. What you ought to do is be prepared for it. And like I said, just being very honest about that stuff, when it happens, can I tell you from my own experience, the best thing you can do is tell your spouse. Have that difficult conversation. Say, hey, there's somebody at work. I, 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 you know, I can't explain it. I'm not doing anything, I'm not trying to do anything, but I'm just, I'm attracted to this person, and I want you to know about it. I guarantee that will immediately diffuse and change the way you see that person and feel about that person. And as the spouse receiving that kind of information, listen and understand. That's not the time to be jealous it's the time to have an open, honest conversation about something that's actually going on, something that the person wants to fix, and they're telling you because they want to fix it before it gets out of control or before something actually happens. Amen? Amen. Amen. Malachi 1.14 says, Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. See, when you take the vow of marriage and you don't honor it, even in the smallest of ways, you defile it, you pollute it. It's like offering God a blemished sacrifice. But the beauty of the gospel is that there can be reconciliation. I don't want to leave you here today with all the, all the things that we've done wrong, 
I don't want you to leave with a heavy heart thinking that, oh well, I don't know, what do I do now? I'm, I'm a real bad, screwed up person now. <laughs> I want you to leave with the understanding that with Christ, there is reconciliation. Verse 10 says that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. You can be the one that shuts the door. When you honor your marital vow, even if you haven't always honored it, when you begin honoring it, you shut that door. When you change your sinful habits, you shut that door. When you begin some of those good habits, like spending more time in God's Word, you're going to shut doors you didn't even know existed. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 Let me just read this, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. Therefore, remember that at one time... You Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near, For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit." There's a lot to unpack in that passage, and we don't have time this morning to go into it, but when I came across that, I was preparing these, these notes. What I saw was a brief summary of the gospel and how we are separated from God, sin separates us from God, and As verse 13 says, now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We can appeal to that blood, that person, Jesus Christ, who can bring us closer. He himself is our peace, made us one and broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. When we don't change our ways, when we continue offering the polluted sacrifices Malachi talked about, we're building a wall of hostility. Maybe you can't even see it. Maybe it's, it's a little wall. You can just step over it now. But you're building ever so slightly, taller and taller, between you and God, really. But God can break that down when we appeal to him. Through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. We have direct access to God. You didn't have to bring an unblemished bull to church today. You didn't have to bring a grain offering without any yeast in it. All you have to do is open your your heart, open your mouth, and talk to him. You don't have to be in this building to do it. That's, that's the beauty of God's Word and the beauty of the message in this book. 
One of my favorite passages of Scripture is from Luke chapter 15. It talks about the prodigal son. And my, a verse that is always meaningful to me says something along the lines of, while he was still a long way off, meaning the son, still full of sin, full of dirt and grime from what he had done, it says the father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. No matter where you are today, God sees you and is filled with compassion for you. Whether you've already taken that step of accepting him into your heart or not, he is filled with compassion for you. Wherever you are in your marriage vow, wherever you are in sin, God is filled with compassion for you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you. I thank you that you are filled with compassion, God. Not a, not a half-hearted, not just a little bit, but your word says you are filled with it. You love us that much, even in our sinful state. You don't give up on us, Lord. You never will. You are always there, always waiting, always hoping. We will turn from our ways and come to you. And Father, we praise you for that salvation. I praise you for the things that you have already done in our lives, for the things that you are going to do, God. We thank you and praise you this morning. Amen and amen.